When we look at music history, many elements of each movement and subgenre from fashion to sound, visuals, and style can usually be traced back to gay culture. We mustn't forget that most of the rock and roll pioneers were black blues musicians who also happened to be queer, like Little Richard and his forebearer Billy Wright, as well as Bessie Smith, Big Mama Thornton, and Ma Rainey. Even long before being LGBTQIA was in the cultural zeitgeist and we were still living in a very homophobic culture, a lot of rock pioneers were queer. Pete Shelley from the Buzzcocks was openly bisexual, and other punk pioneers like Randy Biscuit from the Big Boys and Gary Floyd from the Dicks were openly gay. Jane County from the Electric Chairs is an openly trans woman who was present at the Stonewall Riots in 1969. But one of the biggest subcultures involved in music with an extremely rich history in LGBTQ and queer culture is the underground club culture that paved the way for dance music. Larry Levin was a gay black DJ who worked at the Paradise Garage in downtown New York and he is considered responsible for the ascendance of house music. Without him, dance music would likely be very different today, and a lot more boring. The 80s was obviously a complicated period, culturally. In America, we were dealing with the Reagan administration, and globally, there was the AIDS crisis, something that plagued the community and brought on unprecedented levels of tragedy. One of the ways that queer people dealt with the trauma was by going to the clubs. As Luis Manuel Garcia wrote, in New York City at the beginning of the 1970s, queers of color, primarily African American and Latin Caribbean ancestry, and many straight but not narrow allies, came together to create small pockets of space in the city's harsh urban landscape. Spaces where they could be safe, be themselves, be someone else for a while, and be with others in ways not permitted in the normal everyday world. Music was an essential part of these gatherings, and the sound of these events would eventually develop into the style called disco. The sound was a mix of soul, funk, and Latin music with a driving 4-4 kick drum pattern. It took its name from discotheque, the French word given to nightlife venues that featured recorded music instead of live performances. Garcia continues, but another reason for this absence is that history is written by victors. As dance music became more mainstream and had more crossover success, the people writing its history followed the more relevant threads into primarily straight, white, middle-class environments quickly forgetting about the more queer and colorful scenes that were still dancing and making music. One of these descendants of disco was New Wave, which also incorporated elements of post-punk and synth-pop, and the genre's ties to gay culture also go far and beyond. The enigmatic frontman of Dead or Alive, Pete Burns, was openly bisexual. The legendary Boy George and his group Culture Club won a Grammy for Best New Artist in 1984. One of the most well-known stars in this camp with many ties to gay culture is arguably Debbie Harry from Blondie, whose ties to the New York club scene and queer underground nightlife goes all the way back to Studio 54 and collaborating with Andy Warhol. Another new wave band that achieved their queer icon status pretty quickly, despite none of the members being queer themselves, was the British synth-pop band Depeche Mode. One of their biggest hits, People Are People, quickly became a queer rights anthem and was largely played at a lot of the clubs in the 80s and 90s. And Martin Gore's iconic leather ensembles were without question something he got from visiting queer leather bars and underground clubs and dungeons. And let's not forget the B-52s and their iconic ode to boys in bikinis, Rock Lobster. The B-52s are one of the earlier groups that were equally influential as Blondie, and they didn't just overlap with queer culture. A few of the members were also queer themselves. And frontman Fred Schneider told Michael Martin, 
Rock Lobster got airplay on college and independent radio, but the bigger stations were told not to play us. Nobody was out then. I mean, our friends knew we were gay, and we weren't trying to be coy. Once we were on stage and somebody yelled, Is this a queen band? I think they thought that Kate Pearson and Cindy Wilson were drag queens. So I said, Yes, we're a queen band. What really put us over was performing the song on Saturday Night Live in January 1980. After that, our album flew off the charts. And how can I forget Frankie Goes to Hollywood? They are often considered the butt of a joke when referring to the 80s, but they were also pioneers in their own way. Two of the ex-members of the British group, Paul Rutherford and Holly Johnson, are also openly gay men. And their songs, especially Relax, Rage Hard, and Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, were unabashedly gay with sexually hedonistic undertones. And, of course, because I would be remiss not to mention them, the village people. So queer culture and dance music are largely synonymous with one another. The genre's queer history is largely thought to be hidden by a lot of straight media, but it's only hidden if you're not willing to look, because it's always been there. Queer culture has informed music for decades, behind the scenes and at the forefront, and new wave synth pop, being a descendant of disco, was one of the places where it was especially visible. 